YouTubers, as promised, here is part one of a 15-part series playlist about growing your YouTube audience to massive proportions. Be sure to subscribe and get next week's tip, or if you're a future watcher and the series has already been released, make sure to start the playlist from the beginning. Uh, now, you may look at this and think, well, you don't have a massive audience, why should I listen to you? Well, I'm working on growing. I've done a ton of research, and everything I pass on to you has been researched or proven by somebody who is successful. Uh, think of me as kind of a compiler. I've researched and studied this stuff, and now I'm trying to apply it across my channel. I am your guinea pig. Uh, and motovloggers, you know, we're, we're kind of all the same. So what works on my channel might work on your channel. And also, speaking of motovloggers, when you think about it, you know, motovlogging is an extremely weird niche medium. Think about it. I ride a motorcycle and then talk to myself, and when I don't, I, what I do is ride a motorcycle in silence and then talk to myself later while I watch myself ride a motorcycle in silence. That's what we're doing right now. So, it's weird, okay? When you say, oh, this guy is a nobody, just remember what genre I choose to participate in. Uh, that should say a lot. And even though there are guys out there in the genre with 100,000 plus subscribers, uh, we're not going to be producing any Ray William Johnsons or PewDiePies or Numa Numa guys, okay? Um, and another thing, I have a lot of people ask me about making lots of money through YouTube through motovlogging. <laughs> Here is the fact. Unless your name rhymes with uh, Jar Mickey Mouse or Blake the Wargsteak or Forbeth or... Uh, stay sunk, two heels. <laughs> uh, I know I'm missing a few, but those guys are all 100,000 subscriber people, and they could potentially ugh, potentially earn enough from motovlogging to quit their jobs, and that's potentially. Uh, if you want to know about how much any motovlogger or or anybody on YouTube, for that matter, is making through AdSense, then go ahead and check out SocialBlade.com, uh, and you know, go ahead put my name in there, you can see a rough but fairly accurate estimate of uh, what any YouTuber is making, including yourself, or me, or any of those guys that I rhymed their names with before. It's pretty interesting, but remember, those guys are four guys of thousands of new motovloggers out there. Uh, you know, unless your content is really incredible to break through the mold, you're gonna be fairly small for quite a while, and unless you figure out some amazing way. In which case, please share it! <laughs> What I'm trying to say is, getting into motovlogging, you're not getting into it for the money. You're getting into it because it's something you love, and it's something that you can do with other people that you can build a community with and have a ton of fun. Anyway, what I'm trying to say, I'm not the source of the wisdom, I'm just the guy who's compressing it into a digestible format for you to get the most information without putting hours into the doing the same research on your own. Uh, and I'm the guy who's putting in the test on my own channel and seeing if it actually pans out in motovlogging. And just so you know, just since applying a few of these techniques for myself and posting the first video in this series, my average daily incoming subscribers have doubled. So something is working, and it's working fast. Sounds pretty good, right? Wouldn't you be stoked to double your average incoming subscribers per day? Well, yeah, who doesn't? So we all start somewhere. So keep in mind, even though I'll never have as many views or subscribers as a uh, you know, a teddy bear twerking androgynous pop star named Mylon Bibris. Forget the haters, because somebody loves ya. Uh, this first tip is about camera work, composition, camera position, resolution, storage, and software. Now again, although I'm going to be talking mostly about motovlogging, this does apply to other videos, especially action videos. So, first of all, very, very first, go and please check out the link in the description. Pause this video and then come back, okay? This, this link, this gives you just the very, very basics of shooting and composition and photography. Uh, this is covered in like Photography 101, but it's extremely useful. What I try to remember is the rule of thirds, framing, and balance. And then just kind of experimenting with how different shots work. Now, most of us action guys are using wide-angle cameras strapped to helmets, which is the equivalent of like a Neanderthal playing Beethoven with a severed arm. <laughs> we just do as best we can. So. Much of this stuff does not apply. However, it's really good just to know, so you can think about how you place your camera to get that unique shot. So think about it. Uh, you know, could your bars frame your picture a little bit, or could your camera be positioned so that the bars stay mostly in the lower third of your frame to give your shot a little pop? You know, we are still shooting, 
and so we still want the best shots that we can get with our goofy little head cameras. So we do need to understand what makes good composition. And how do we get good composition from a camera strapped to our heads? Well, there is actually a lot to think about. So are you going to go above or under the visor with your, with your camera? I've heard complaints about helmet cameras mounted the tops of helmets because it's high up and you can't see the bars, so there's literal or no reference of what the bike is doing underneath you, and you get kind of that floating effect. Then again, positioning your camera under the visor, a la, you know, Ride Victoria or Accidental Broadcast, it looks great, but if your peak is too short, it can jack up your own eyeballs field of view. And the functionality of the setups, again, depends on the length of your peak, or even if you have a peak, or the room behind your visor, uh, you know. Anyway, uh, maybe you want to mount the thing on the side of your helmet. I've seen, uh, I've heard a couple people complain about losing screen real estate from side mounts. Uh, you know, you get the side of the helmet in your shot. But this is probably the least wobbly area to mount a camera because it's right on the axis of your head. So a bump translates to far less motion. Um, think about it, you know, put your finger right above your ear and then move your head around and now put your finger on your chin and move your head around and see how, see the difference in how far your finger moves. Well, when you're bumping around, that same thing happens. Um, here's the thing though, for some reason I don't like it on the side. Uh, it doesn't mean I won't watch moto vloggers with it on the side or anything like that, it's not that bad, but I just don't like it. Um, sure there's lost, less wobble but there's something about it that just kind of bothers me. Maybe it's kind of the OCD of it all. I don't know, I just like things to be centered. Um, so speaking of centered, are you going to mount it on the chin bar? That's where mine is mounted. And although I like having the bars bob around in the shot to get a feel of the terrain I'm hitting, uh, having it clear out there on the chin and away from the axis of my head does get more head wobble and bounce because each bump moves the camera that much more. Uh, it's also not wheelie friendly because when you pull the bars up, your frame fills with your controls. And, you know, since I kind of suck at wheelies, that really doesn't bother me though. However, when I do a hill climb, you know it's getting steep when I'm standing up and the bars cut clear up into my fear of field of view. Since steepness is really hard to portray on a camera, especially wide angle lenses, I really like the effect of the and figure. It's worth a little bit more wiggle when it's mounted on my chin. And lately I actually experimented with a GoPro chesty mount, and I thought the results were pretty cool. Uh, there's less wiggle, it's a nice low viewpoint, and it keeps things in the thirds. And since I stand up a lot uh, on the dirt, I really liked it. So uh, stay tuned for a Thursday's vlog, that's when I, that's when I test it out. Uh, you guys tell me what you think. So speaking of standing up while riding, you need to think about the type of terrain you'll be doing. If you're on the road, wobble won't be that big of a problem. If you're in the dirt, you might want to keep the camera as close to your ear as possible because again, the closer to the axis of your head the camera is, the less wobble you get. Keep in mind too, that if you're on a really bumpy stuff like I am, the wobble will decrease if your helmet fits nice and snug. So my helmet doesn't fit very snugly, so I get a bit more wobble. Um, trust me, I'm working on it with the chesty and stuff. Uh, you also need to keep in mind the position that your body will be in when you ride. If you're going to be clear down over the tank on a sport bike, you're not going to want a low camera or a low camera angle or, heaven forbid, a chesty. Uh, if you're standing up on a dual sport, having a camera on the top of your helmet is going to make you look like you're riding around on the Empire State Building. Just keep in mind that when, uh, what do you want in the shot? If you've got a large windshield, probably, you know, people don't want to, to stare at that and your controls uh, through the whole ride. Uh, if you see too much bar, it could ruin your panoramic views. If you get too little bar, you seem to float around with no sense of terrain. Uh, also take note of where your camera is pointing. Always, 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 always. So much footage of mine has been botched from a wonky ankle or a, a wonky angle or a little tilt. Yeah, wonky ankle. <laughs> uh, if the angle isn't too bad, you can fix it with some video magic in post, but that will mo most likely involves screwing up the quality of the, your video, so you might as well just get it right the first time. For me, it was a long process. Sometimes the camera's aiming at the sky, other times it's crooked, sometimes it's pointing clear at my boots. Um, yeah, anyway, here's a tip. Most wide-angle cameras have snapshot functions built in, and a few of them sync, sync to a smartphone. Test your shot before doing any kind of mounting. See what you like. Stick it on there with some duct tape and test it out. Wiggle your head around in the mirror and see if your helmet slides around on your head too much. If it does, you might want to consider a new helmet or at least new padding inside your helmet. Uh, the last thing you want to do is end up with a bad angle or a weird bracket placement 
or various mounts and sticky pads all over, all over your helmet. <clears throat> uh, for example, my helmet, it's like a botched mount graveyard. Um, anyway, one more thing about camera angles. Uh, don't be afraid to check your mirror often to make sure your camera is still pointed in the right direction, especially if you're moving around a lot. Brackets on GoPros uh, can shift with a lot of bumpy terrain. Also, don't be afraid to clean off the lens once in a while during your ride. You can always edit out uh, if you're self-conscious about people seeing you check your equipment, but you never know when you'll be spewing out the greatest motovlog dialogue of your entire lifetime, and there's a huge June bug all over your viewer's face to ruin that whole experience. Uh, now here's some serious subjectivity, okay? And, and we all know it and we all think about it. First person views get boring. They do, they do. They are so limited on what's actually happening. You can't see the bike, you can't see the rider, the landscape gets washed out into the distance because the field of view is so wide, you can't see things that are far away, and the image is usually distorted around the edges pretty badly. Uh, when you think about it, nothing about wide-angle cameras is good except for the field of view and the sense of speed. Uh, think about this. Everybody has experienced it where you get home from your ride and you think, oh man, that ditch looks a lot bigger in real life. If you think about it, wide-angle cameras and point-of-view filming is actually a terrible medium for, for shooting nature. Uh, that's why you need to think of different views that let the viewer know what's going on outside of your field of view. External shots can make all the difference. In fact, some of my favorite and most popular motovlogging videos I have seen A, don't have motovlog dialogue in them, and B, have very little or absolutely no first-person shots in them. Does that necessarily make them super popular? Not necessarily, but they are some of my favorites. Um, so, how do you get external with your shots? Well, it could be as easy as setting your cell phone down on a rock while you do a hill climb. Or it could be having somebody come out and film you. Maybe you and your buddy both have helmet cameras, but you take no point of view footage with them. You just switch off shooting each other doing cool stuff. Maybe you do the same thing, but with cell phones. I don't know. Uh, I definitely think it's worth spending a few bucks on a cheap gorilla pod or something, uh, a knockoff of some kind to get a good external shot. And on that vein, I have a buddy take some, some of those great external shots for you to save for your thumbnail image. Trust me, I'll be talking a lot about this uh, in a later tip, but a thumbnail with a first-person view will never generate the interest and views for your video that a thumbnail with a third-person view of you and your motorcycle will. Okay, so now here comes some shameless self-promotion. I'm currently developing a mount that shoots third-person. If you just can't wait, uh, you can build your own. There are plenty of tutorials on YouTube, or you can buy a sales system or a view Vantage. Both of them are awesome products, and they'll give you a unique third-person shot. Or you can wait a little while for what you know we've codenamed the Bacon Holder to come out, and you can get some truly amazing action shots, whether motorcycling or not. And the features, uh, there's, I'm going to do some different things with this thing that are going to make it incredible, so you're not going to want to miss out on that. Um, anyway, the last way to get unique footage in third person is not advised and it's very dangerous, but you can always stick a camera to a pole and film yourself riding with one hand while controlling the throttle and brake with the other. Again, it's nuts and I don't recommend it, especially on dirt or, or, or even the road or, <laughs> or heaven forbid in the air. So just don't do it unless you've got a spine of titanium. I've seen some guys do it and the result is awesome, but seriously, Use both of your hands to ride. Uh, a bit of good footage isn't worth a bad crash and a, and a missed riding season because your hands weren't on the controls. So, okay. Now we're getting on to the boring technical mumbo jumbo. So grab yourself an energy drink so you can stay awake. Go ahead and slap yourself on the cheek because we're moving on to the exciting world of resolutions and frame rates, okay? I get asked questions about these maybe more than just about anything else. So that's why I'm including it. Extremely boring, let's move on. Many of the devices like tablets and phones that people watch YouTube videos on won't even dis display a full 1080p. So there's no reason to go nuts with 1080p or, or higher, I think. In fact, if you have a video game uh, system like a PS3 or Xbox 360 and you think the graphics are pretty good, just remember that almost all games display at 720p, not full, full 1080p HD. You also need to think about what kind of resolution you'll record in. These days it has to be HD, um, 720 or 1080, even 4K. I record 
personally at 720p at 60 frames per second which allows me to slow things down if I want to go for those crash compilations that, that everybody does and get millions and millions of views. So if you slow down footage recorded in 30 frames per second, it starts to look choppy. Um, let me explain this. Here's some simple math. You can slow down footage shot at 60 frames per second by half and still get a smooth 30 frame per second frame rate. Do you get that? Now here's the thing, for most of your footage, YouTube only displays about 30 frames per second, so no matter what you shoot in, realistically it doesn't matter much. But when you're editing your video, remember that filming in 60 frames per second allows you to slow down your video by half and still look very smooth and good. However, um, with a quicker frame rate, less light enters the camera, so 60 frames per second looks great in bright sunlight, but it will be darker than 30 frames per second in lower lights. I've also found that for me, I, can, I can't really tell the difference between 1080 and 720 on YouTube. So I might as well save disk space and get the ability to shift footage to slow motion if I want to. The frame rate, 30 or, th or 60 frames per second, and the resolution, 720 or 1080, make a big difference on how much space your memory card gets used up too. So if you're planning on recording a massive trip, 720p at 30 frames per second might be a good option. However, if you want to get out and get beautiful shots or, uh, or shoot a short scenic vlog, then 1080p at 30 or even 60 frames per second, if your camera will do it, will look excellent. Uh, here are some specs for inexpensive cameras. I use the GoPro Hero 2. It's reliable, it's durable, it's easy to hook a mic to, and it's inexpensive. It films in 1080p at 30 frames per second or 720p at 60 frames per second. I didn't even bother with the other modes. I don't bother with ProTune either. Uh, sure, you can get great colors in post, but in raw footage, it actually tones down the colors so you can make it more vibrant in post. I don't have time to make it vibrant in post, so I stick with the colors that the GoPro gives me in its regular default modes. ProTune is also a memory hog, and keep in mind what kind of bit, rate, bit rates YouTube can even display and what your audience's internet connection will sustain even if YouTube can do it. Uh, another camera that I really, really like is the Sony Action Cam AS15. It does have a standard audio out, uh, microphone in plug, but you have to mod the case in order to get your mic into it, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, mounting options are pretty slim, and forget putting it on your chin bar or under your peak. It's kind of an elongated torpedo style camera. The lens doesn't rotate, and there aren't many options to rotate it from the original position. And you might, out, uh, you might actually have to use stuff called dual lock, which is like super velcro, to mount it. Um, the interface is also a bit clunky, but here's the thing, and it's a big but. The footage it takes is fantastic for the price. If you find it on a deal, which I often post to my Facebook page, then you can snag a new one for around 120 bucks, maybe with some accessories for around 140 They are rock solid reliable, easy, to pi easy as pie to use, they have Wi-Fi to connect to your phone, they have pretty decent battery life, they record in some great modes. It also has steady shot function that works amazingly if you plan on using it like a handheld, but I've heard complaints about it on a helmet. It does smooth things amazingly on a helmet. Uh, it kind of makes it look floaty. I like it, but some people don't. Uh, it films in 170 degree wide, 120 degrees in steady mode. It can handle 1080p at 60 frames per second and 720p at 120 frames per second. That is Hero 3 territory right there without the price or reliability issues of a Hero 3. Uh, it doesn't capture sound in super slow-mo though, but it does encode at 4x slow motion, so it's 30 frames per second. So when you pull out your footage off the card, it's already slowed down and it's gorgeous. Once again, uh, with the higher um, frame rates, light can become an issue. The more frames per second, the less time the camera has to capture light and detail. So there will be artifacts and it will look darker, but still, 4x slow motion looks awesome. If you're shooting in daylight, which you should be doing anyway with an action camera like this, then it's gonna look fantastic. One of the biggest and most important things when it comes to your camera is your storage medium. Don't overlook this. Yeah, this is your memory card, okay? If you've ever noticed that your footage gets blocky or pixelated, 
well on YouTube that happens because it's a slow connection. If you're pulling raw footage from your camera and it's blocking your pixelated, that usually means that you have an SD card that can't keep up with the footage you're recording. You must have a class 10 SD card if you plan on doing 1080p or 720p at 60 frames per second, or if you plan on even riding quickly through the trees at a lower setting. Cameras are great at filming things that don't move quickly. Since on a helmet camera the entire scene is whizzing by, then it is really chugging to try to keep up. This is one more reason to have something constant in the shot, like your handlebars or even yourself. Anyway, uh, I know a nice memory card is just another expense, but if you want to capture good footage, a high speed or ultra high speed SD card is a must. Uh, I use a 32 gigabyte SanDisk as Extreme that reads and writes at 45 megabytes per second. Once in a while I find deals on SD cards and stuff like that and I'll post them to my Facebook page. So if you're interested in finding good deals on motorcycle and filming stuff, I would love to have you join me on there. There's a link in the description. <clears throat> And finally, when it comes to video software, it really doesn't matter what you use as long as you know one thing. You're going to get the very best results if you set your output settings to output to the format that you recorded in. For example, if you recorded in 720p, output to 720p. Um, if, you're, if it's recording in you know, MPEG-4, then try to output in MPEG-4. I Honestly, I'm going to get a bazillion questions about this. You guys, please don't ask questions about this. If you have questions, please look for a tutorial on YouTube. There's thousands out there. I can't cover the specifics of every program. I only use Sony Vegas and a little bit of, uh, of the Adobe one, After Effects or whatever it is, Premiere. But if you search YouTube for output and rendering tutorials for your specific edit editor, it's going to cover it, and you're going to get good, good results. Uh, I don't know everything about this. And, you know, there are a ton of people with questions about what software to use. So my advice would be to pick one, get used to it, and go with it. I personally use Sony Vegas Platinum 11 because that's what I learned on in college. It's, it's like a $30 consumer program. I also have Adobe Premiere Pro and After Effects, yet I'm used to the workflow of the cheapo copy of Vegas. I know that Premiere is way better and can do a lot more, but I'm comfortable and most importantly, I'm fast with Vegas. For a guy like me with not a lot of time or money making amateur YouTube videos, Vegas works fine. And I have yet to find something that I, that I can't figure out how to do in Vegas. Now, even though it's a consumer version of a video program, keep in mind that these are pretty advanced programs and to do anything besides the very basics, which you probably won't need, you're going to need to watch some serious tutorials on YouTube to get to know the program. And even though I'm nothing special, I sometimes do get very kind comments about my editing. And that didn't come overnight. I've had thousands of hours of tutorial watching to get me where I'm at. And I'm still a complete noob at a lot of this stuff. So if you want to make advanced stuff, you can learn it, but it's going to take some time. We can't all be, you know, Michael Bay. Truthfully, a lot of folks get by with a few cuts here and there, some text, you're good. You don't need to go crazy on this. Now, some guys will go crazy on this, and they will take it to the next level. I choose not to because I don't have a ton of time on my hands. But if you want, you can get into color correction, stabilizing, you know, ridiculously high resolutions and record speeds. Just keep in mind that it all translates to YouTube and what YouTube can handle. And not only that, but the technology that your viewers are using. You know, Kalani, for example, uploads some things in 4K, and you can watch it in 4K, but on my end, I'm watching through a 1080p monitor at, you know, a max out of 10 megabytes per second. I'm not going to get good 4K. Things that you might keep in mind. People's internet connection, their screen resolution, even their eyesight. Uh, in my opinion, as long as you've got the basics down, Use a decent HD resolution like 720p, and then put enough work into your videos that it looks like you're trying. You'd probably be better off putting time into your storyboarding and edits instead of post-production effects. Uh, then again, if you live in Maui and you're really, really good at photography and post-production to make your videos incredibly vibrant, then do that. Definitely do that. <laughs> and while you're at it, if you somehow missed him, subscribe to the guy I'm talking to about who puts a ton of work into his videos, Accidental Broadcast. Uh, I don't think there's a motovlogger out there who puts in the post-production time that he does. Um, 
why he's not the single largest moto vlogger in the world, I really will never understand. In my opinion, he is definitely the best, bar none. Uh, anyway, ladies and gentle tubers, it has been long enough. Hopefully I've covered what you have wanted to know and uh, that you've learned a ton from this video. And if you have any questions, be sure to ask them in the comments and I will do my best to get back to them and get a logical answer your way. So stay tuned for next week episodes on audio tips if you survived this one. And if you've got anything new at all from this video, uh, if you've learned anything, I would really appreciate you hitting that like button below. And if you're not subscribed yet, now would be a great time to become an EverRider. Uh, uh, does that sound nerdy, EverRider? Well, whatever, whatever. If you guys liked what you saw, then subscribe for more. That is all. Much love, you guys. EverRide out.